We'll just give it a second here. All right, I think we're good to go. So once again, um, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, I'm Nicole Boomgarden from Go Green Wilmette's board. And tonight's topic is uh, recycling demystified. Uh, we know it's a confusing topic. We get questions a lot from probably many of you on the call tonight, uh, which we love. And tonight we have two amazing presenters, uh, two really experts that we rely on a lot for questions. When you come to us with questions, we rely heavily on them. And they always take the time to answer questions. They're a huge resource for us. Um, and we're, we're really appreciative for their time tonight and throughout the year uh, to be a resource to us. Um, so the first presenter that we have tonight is uh, Mary Allen from Swank. And I'm gonna just uh, read her bio to everybody so you can get a good idea of Mary's background. So Mary Allen is the Recycling and Education Director for Solid Waste Agency of North Cook County, Swank, a nonprofit uh, intergovernmental agency comprised of 23 municipalities to include the village of Wilmette. Mary began her tenure with Swank in 1995 and is responsible for development and administration of Swank's community and school programs that focus on preventing waste and toxicity through source reduction, recycling, composting, and safe disposal. She further coordinates Swank's public outreach and develops the agency's resources. So uh, just once again, before I flip it over to Mary, if you do have questions, just throw that into the, the Q&A and, and not the chat and just make sure to upvote any questions. Uh, if you have a question you see it's been asked before, just upvote it and then we know which ones that um, we really should focus on answering. So without further ado, I'll flip it over to Mary who's gonna take over the presentation. All righty. Um, thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you to Beth and, and the whole team that put um, the, the series of presentations together for the benefit of you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you tonight. Um, I'd like to just start out by reminding everybody that everybody, everything is interconnected. We share the same land, the same air, the same water with over 7 billion neighbors. Our environment doesn't know political colors or has boundaries. Additionally, everything we buy and use comes from a resource our earth provides. And when we buy less, recover more, it not only conserves water and energy and natural resources, but it reduces landfill and greenhouse gas emissions. So my presentation tonight is to make you more of the aware, aware of the resources that we use and also the benefits of preventing waste and recycling right. It is my hope that each of you will gain a better understanding of the importance of reducing waste and why curbside recycling programs have limitations. Okay, so just kind of as a Basic overview, this is something that isn't new to probably all of you. Um, the hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle, compost. Um, as consumers, this is the power we have to engage in the most effective means of sustainable materials management. By rethinking our habits, by refusing and making different choices through reducing our consumption about not making waste in the first place. Those all have a priority. So it starts at the top and then it goes through the reuse, which includes refurbish, repair and repurpose. And then recycle is a part of the puzzle, a part of the solution, but not just by itself. It's recycling, not just for the sake of recycling, but to achieve an environmental a positive outcome. And the way that we can know that and the way moving forward companies are going to be held to um, understanding more about the circularity of the products that they're making and the materials that they're using is to do the life cycle analysis, which evaluates the embodied value of each product to get the true cost of the carbon footprint. It's no secret that plastic and, pl and other litter is a global problem. It negatively impacts our wildlife, our ecosystems, and even our food chain. 
It's estimated that more than 9 million tons of plastic is dumped into oceans from beaches, from ships, a lot of different ways that ends up in our waterways each year. And wildlife can't differentiate between a small piece of food and a small piece of plastic. Of the nearly 3 million tons of plastic produced each year, half is for single use products. So I'm going to speak to some of the solutions that organizations and conglomerations are doing, um, but I'm gonna save it till the end. Um, and then if you have additional questions, I'd be happy to answer those then. So let's say bye-bye to single use items. There are wonderful initiatives that are happening happening all over the world, but let's look right here in our neighborhoods to what we can do to minimize the single use products that we um, use and throw away. So good place to start is by improving upon and purchasing durable reusable goods instead of the one-time use, to purchase food in little or no packaging at farmer's markets and at our food stores remembering to take not only the shopping bags, but the produce bags with us. Um, there's also a bill right now in, in, down in Springfield that the Illinois Environmental Council is trying to push through. Jen Walling just told us on a, a call that she is trying to get through the reusable containers that consumers can bring into restaurants and retail stores um, so we don't have to take uh, the packaging that our food comes in. Very similar to what Europe has been doing for a long time. Um, now that we're seeing the, the forest through the trees um, as vaccines are coming into existence, we're hoping to get out of the single use item mindset and getting back into our good habits of reusables. Um, the Shed Aquarium has an initiative, lots of initiatives actually, they started with Shed the Straw and now there's pledges you can do and they're working with restaurants and they're working with retailers to eliminate the single use. You can go on there, let's shed the plastic um, to get more information. Cut out cutlery is a thing that just makes so much sense. If we're getting takeout food and it's coming home to us or it's coming to our office, we don't need the cutlery. Chances are we have reusable or at least the bamboo um, travel utensils with us. So say no to the plastic, say no to the straw, say no to the napkin, say no to the condiments. If you have a full bottle of ketchup, you don't need the little packets that you have to rip open with your teeth and wind up on your, your shirt rather than on your, your food. Um, so habitsofwaste.org. If any of you are taking notes, I have lots of things to throw out to you. So that is something to um, look up. And then there's two initiatives working with restaurants. One is dispatched goods. It's a reusable container system where customers pay a deposit. They get their food in either a stainless steel, depending on which, which um, model it is, because Deliver Zero is trying to do this too. They're starting in New York. So either you get a reusable um, container or one that's stainless steel. And then there's Think Disposable. So this shouldn't just be happening in restaurants. We should be doing it at our businesses, our place of works, government to where if there's food being exchanged, they could be served in reusable containers. You see that in the airports, maybe not recently, maybe not in the last year, but the vending machines that have the glass jars with salad and other things in. And when you, when you buy it and eat it, you can, there's several redemption places you can take it back to. That's the thinking that we all need to get into moving forward to really say bye-bye to single use items. So for repair, repurpose, and donate, um, Adam Minter is the author of a book called Second Hand. And he says, second hand is a trade that should be celebrated. Globalized trade is second hand goods evolved on its own, connecting those who have stuff with people that don't. Um, there are many ways and opportunities to donate, to repair, repurpose locally, 
And if you go to Swank, and also in the Chicagoland area, and if you go to Swank's website, we have a reuse and recycling directory that will help you navigate to find a solution for things that you're looking to do one of those things with. Um, uh, social media platforms to give things away are wonderful. This buy nothing is something I participate in Park Ridge. When I have something, I can post it on Facebook and it's amazing within minutes, people will go interested. You range for porch pickup and you've given something away and somebody benefits from what you no longer need. And as we know with textiles, there's um, a lot of opportunity for donations. All right, so the knit and the grit, why many of you are here tonight, it's so important to understand the beginning of my presentation because that is where minimizing and preventing waste comes from. But again, recycling is a piece of the solution for it. Um, and so I thought I would just kind of start with back in um, recycling, curbside recycling started right around 1990. Some communities started in the late 80s, but most 90, 91, 92. And in the beginning, everybody received an 18 gallon bin um, or two or three, and they weren't covered. And we tried to smash things and fit it in and they were picked up weekly. But then in 95, the industry started to do a shift um, from the small bins to a cart on wheels with a lid and they were larger than those little bins and held more recycling. And it was easier for people to get the bins to the curb or to their alley and they could keep the materials dry because of the lid. Um, so for several decades, um, this is exactly what we did. Um, US collected our recycling and about 70% of it, not quite, was exported to China and other distant countries. Rapid economic growth, high demand for materials, cheap labor made it economical for the countries to sort through our recyclables that were often commingled with low value or unrecyclable materials, such as food, diapers, electronics, or just plain garbage. So once these countries had sorted out the valuable materials, they would throw out or incinerate the rest. Practices that we've learned detriment, that are now detrimental to both public health and the environment. In 2018, China instituted a green sword policy, restricting exports, especially mixed paper, low grade plastics. And other countries now have followed China's lead. Overnight, market prices dropped and US recyclers were left with materials that they couldn't move and dealing with our flawed system. So there are three basic things that make a successful recycling program. Having a large quantity of the same material, the same stream, technology to sort the materials efficiently and market demand for the materials. Wish cycling, causes loads of recyclable to be contaminated, which is when materials are put into a cart that aren't accepted by the recycler. Since the materials aren't being exported anymore, the unacceptable materials have to be separated out by the recyclers at a cost to them. So private hauling companies don't, aren't in business to lose money. They've moved from a traditional commodity price base model to a processing cost fee-based model. Consumers usually end up paying for the higher charges, as many of your communities might have seen with upcharges or um, the attempt to get more money for recycling to cover some of these losses. So curbside recycling has limits. From this point on, I want you to forget everything that you've been told, everything you think you know. I want us to go back to this being a basic tutorial about what you can recycle curbside, okay? Erase. So I've been serving on a task force for recycling contamination 
solutions with all of the haulers, all of the material recovery facility operators with local, regional, and state government representatives and industry um, representatives for the last two and a half years. Two years ago, we all came to, after surveying the MRFs at what each one takes, what they can process, we came up with this list of recyclables for curbside. Materials need to be clean, empty, dry, and loose. No putting in plastic bags in your recycling cart. They need to be loose. You can keep them in a bag inside, but you need to empty them loose into your outside cart. The limited materials that are accepted for plastics, it's and I'm going to go through each stream of, of material with you in just a minute. So this is just a quick overview. With plastics, it's bottles, jugs, tubs, and food-related jars. Glass jars and bottles, metal and steel, aluminum and steel cans, pans, foil, um, certain aerosol cans, and then um, mixed paper and cartons. Even with the flaws of our recycling system, it's not going away. There's been lots and lots of investments made and it's starting to build a stronger infrastructure to manage these materials domestically. Um, there's a new goal by our US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. They have a new goal set to recycle 50% by 2030. And that includes in its mix, um, landscape organics. It, does, it excludes food organics. That's a whole nother webinar. Um, so as paper mills and recyclers invest in new technology such as optical sorters, artificial intelligence, these materials curbside are finding their way finally to domestic markets. However, it's going to take time and it will take money to build that infrastructure to be more efficient and effective. So for now, it, again, let's go back to the basics. And let me go through with you in a tutorial about how materials should be prepared and then again, what each material um, is wanted curbside. So empty and rinse bottles and cans in containers to remove food or beverage residue. Place only approved items in the cart. Do not bag recyclables, put them in the outside cart loose. Put caps back on plastic bottles and jugs and don't crush them. I know this goes against your grain because in the, when I first started with Swank, it was different. So for today, moving forward, bottles and jugs, put the lid back on and don't crush them. Flatten boxes and put the boxes inside your recycling cart. If you put them on top, if you put them on the side, the chances are they're going to be picked up for garbage. Labels can remain on jars and bottles and plastic windows on envelopes. Keep the lid on your recycling cart closed at all times so the materials stay dry. Again, the four words are empty, clean, loose, and dry. So I'm going to take you through materials very quickly um, because there's still more to go through um, on the other end and well, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we can talk about them later. So paper is the first stream I wanna talk about. We're talking about magazines, newspapers, junk mail, office paper, plain greeting cards, um, no shredded paper. If you can see at the bottom on my slides, I'm gonna have no's. Shredding paper cannot go curbside. Shredding, if you need your documents shredded that have personal information, Swank has um, 19 shredding events that will be scheduled between spring, summer, and fall. You can attend one of those. Um, as you can see, when it goes to a sorting facility, it makes a mess. It, it's a party. The it's like confetti going all over everything or glitter. Um, do not recycle hardbound books. Those can be taken to scarce um, for reuse. She has a book reuse um, our book rescue program. And then don't recycle your receipts. Um, even though there's been a law in Illinois passed not to have BPA in these receipts, 
they still can contain chemicals that the recyclers don't want in the mix of paper. Flattened boxes for food boxes. Um, Non-waxed boxes. And the best way to look is look inside the lid and if it's brown or if it's white without any wax, you can take your nail and scratch it. It can be flattened and recycled. Um, ice cream, frozen food containers, these have wax liners and go in the garbage. Cartons are paper. They're very long fiber paper that are desired. So the Carton Council has spent the last 10 years and a lot of money um, getting material recovery facilities to separate for them. And then they go through a process to where they're made into new paper products or wallboard. Um, it's either the gable top juice or milk carton or the broth beverage um, tetra pack or juice box. Make sure the straw has been taken out. And the caps are, are asked to be left on these as well so they don't get flat and they're easier to sort at the facility. Juice pouches are not part of this equation. There are special material program take backs that I'll talk about a little bit later. One is TerraCycle that will take some of these hard to manage materials and find ways to either repurpose them or uh, um, recycle them. Flatten boxes put them in your cart. Contrary to what the recycling partnership has promoted the last year, do not recycle oiled, greasy pizza boxes. If you have a pizza box that is oily and greasy on one side and the top is fine, you can rip it off and recycle it. And don't recycle mixed materials. This has cardboard, but it also has metal. Same with this one. And this is cardboard with plastic. The aluminum um, cans, make sure they're clean. You can keep the lid, you can put them back in um, with the ergodynamics, with the trucks picking up with a, uh, an automatic arm. We're not concerned anymore with cutting, um, you know, people handling these materials because once they get sorted, um, they, they, they're not touched. Um, so you can put the top back in inside. You can do foil pans, personal care product and food aerosol cans, but they must be empty. They must have all the air out of them. And then absolutely never put in tanks, even though it's metal, um, no batteries, new ba all the fires that are starting now in recycling facilities and, and transfer stations are started from um, lithium batteries that I'll address at the very end. And no pots and pans. Yes, they're aluminum. Yes, they're steel, but not curbside. So if you can find a way to reuse them, great. Um, a lot of metals can be taken to a, a metal scrap dealer um, for some money they'll give you for some of your items. For glass, it's food and beverage jars and bottles. So you can put your lid in if it's three inches or larger. So a cap from a beer bottle will clog machines. It, they, it's not wanted. If you can't find a way to repurpose it, please um, throw it away. So when you put something in your recycling cart that's glass, but not food quality glass or beverage glass, it contaminates the load. And that includes things like ceramics, mirror glass, vases, light bulbs. And then if you have broken glass, um, certainly don't put it in your recycling cart as well. Put that in a bag, um, mark it broken glass so nobody get, gets cut. Plastics, again, bottles, jugs, jars, and tubs. Leave the lid on the, the jugs and the bottles. That helps hold the um, the container so the optical sorters will pick it up when it gets sorted. On containers that have lids, please throw the lids away. The only lids that are wanted are the ones on bottles and jugs. And don't leave them loose in a cart. And again, don't crush plastic containers. So there's other plastics. Um, and um, I think 
what led us to a lot of contamination was following this grid one through seven. That's how we were taught to recycle. Look at the bottom of the container. Recyclers don't want you looking at these numbers anymore. They were never meant for consumers. And so with plastics, it's no foam. It's the white expanded, but it's really hard to know if a clear container is a six or a one without looking at the bottom. So no sixes, um, it's pretty much ones, if you're gonna look at the bottom, what they want, the bottles and jars are ones in, or bottles and jugs are ones and twos. Jars and tubs typically are fours and fives and no foam, no mixed material. This is plastic with metal, um, no cups, no black plastic, no styrofoam. This is the foam I was talking about. If you have the white expanded, it can be taken to Apt Electronics in Glenview can also be taken out to Aurora, to Dart, who is the manufacturer. And then plastic bags can go back to a retail store along with film. So once we do what I'm asking you to do, what happens to the materials? Where do they go and how they're sorted? So the MRF is a materials facil um, sorting facility. This is the inside of Groots and Elk Grove Village. And the materials will come in the recycling. It'll go into a big um, area like this and get scooped up and put on conveyor belts where people, machines, um, sometimes artificial intelligence known as robots will do the sorting. Oftentimes we can't go see behind the scenes. So um, I just wanna point out one thing and then I have a short video to show you. Plastic bags, this is why they're not welcome. They, they clog the, the star sorters um, as they rotate and then people, laborers have to get in there and cut them out. It takes a lot of time and time is money for these companies. So I'm going to show you Lakeshore Recycling's new robot. Um, it's the artificial intelligent and it does a positive sort. So it can pick out materials that it's looking for. Um, to make a good bail. So you know, um, Winnetka has Lakeshore Recycling. Um, and, th and that's why sometimes I, I always say, ask your recycler for the up most up-to-date information because what I'm telling you is general basic information. And some when you have special technology like this, there are times that they can take materials other recyclers right now are not taking. So keep the loop going. It's about circularity. It's about the circular economy. What we recycle gets made into new products. And moving forward, product manufacturers and designers are working towards keeping materials in a continual loop to make their products. Extended producer responsibility or EPR is where manufacturers bear a significant responsibility for the environmental impacts and the recovery of their products. And we're seeing that happen now with some of the groups I'm going to mention um, in a couple slides.
So in a circular economy, a product is preserved as close to its finished state as possible, which preserves as much of its value as possible. Also getting away from the traditional linear economy leads us to an increased economic and environmental um, sustainability. There are programs for materials that can be reused or recycled, but not curbside. And Swank's website has all of these listed. Real quick, there's Trex Lumber that makes a plastic substitute. Um, it's, it's for wood. And you can recycle plastic bags, film from cleaning, um, little pillows, the wax bags from crackers, and many other kinds of films. Um, at a lot of retail stores, they have a drop off for that. So that serves as the feedstock for this United States manufacturing company. Planet Green Recycling has a couple things going on. They, they claim just the millions of ink cartridges that get thrown away each year. And so they ask if you have four cartridges or more, they will pay for your shipping to their California facility to have them recycled and refurbished. Um, they also have a fundraising opportunity for nonprofits and schools, and then they sell their refurbished in, in cartridges. TerraCycle has zero waste boxes. They say that there isn't anything you can send them that they can't find a solution for. And so they work with a lot of manufacturers that subsidize the programs and, and do the research. Um, the drop it off is in, um, this is, Patagonia, where there's a lot of reclamation of textiles. Nike's been doing it for shoes for a long time, um, H&M, Patagonia, um, and, and other brands will take back textiles and will be, they'll be made back into sometimes new products for store shelves and or other things. Tennis balls have a recycling program and so do these little pill bottles. Albertsons is working with um, Jewel Osco here in the United States to capture these for, for reuse and distribution um, in other countries. So you can check with your local Jewel Osco. It's just beginning here in the United States. If not in the agency's closing the loop brochure, Matthew Ministries, you can mail them to that organization. So these, this is the list of, and I don't want to take the time to get into each one of them, but no, there's lots going on where the manufacturers are coming together with the package designers and with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is spearheading a lot of this with the, the World Economic Forum and the new, the plastics pack. One thing I will say about the plastics pack that by the year 2025, one of their pillars of sustainability is to call for plastic packaging to be free of hazardous chemicals. Gee, wouldn't that be nice? Um, unfortunately, with the plastic packaging, whether it's styrene, BPA, um, it lends itself then to have alternate materials have the, the characteristics to make that container special, to make it waterproof. And so that's when PFSAs are coming into some of our packaging as an unintended consequence, even compostables. So BPI and the um, Center for Environmental Health have a list of approved containers um, that don't contain chemicals. And I will provide that to Nicole that she can share with you um, if you'd like. The Recycling Partnership just got together a stakeholder group called the Polypropylene Recycling Coalition and Film and Flexibles Coalition. Bottom line, as electric cars need less fuel, our plastics are made by, with petrochemicals. That industry has to be able to be viable and still be in business and make money. So they're they're finally sitting at a table to collaborate to find out how best their products can stay in the loop, how they can be involved, and how their presence will hopefully um, help municipal programs not be as expensive because the cost will, they will help with the cost with the, the recovery and recycling of their materials. 
encourage you to um, check out Swank's new website. It's so new that since I did this presentation, I didn't, I don't have a, a snapshot of the new one. Um, it's easier for people to use, and there are a lot of different resources. Please like us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up to receive our e-list. And at this time, I will um, turn it over to Kate. All righty, thank you very much. Or actually, are we going to Nicole first? Yeah, let's go back to me just for a second so I can introduce you. Um, so Mary, thank you for that presentation. It's always, I always learn something new with your presentations. Uh, it was chock full of information. I could probably watch it a couple more times and pick up new information. So, so thank you. Uh, our next speaker presenter is um, Kate M. Russo. She's going to talk for about 10 minutes, more specifically to WOMET, uh, but it's definitely um, worthwhile for everybody else to stick on the presentation because there'll be some information I'm sure you can leverage as well. So I'll do a quick introduction of Kate and then she'll, she'll take off with her presentation. So Kate is the assistant to the director of WOMET Public Works. She began working for WOMET Public Works in 2011 and is responsible for a myriad of duties, including overseeing the village's national pollutant discharge elimination system program and Wilmette's solid waste contract with waste management, formerly advanced disposal. Having received a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Champaign, Kate also designs and manages most of the landscaping projects throughout the village with a focus on sustainable and pollinator friendly designs. So again, if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and throw those in the q and I see we have a bunch already. Uh, don't forget about the upvote um, feature to go ahead and look at uh, if there's any questions that have already been asked, just upvote those. And with that, you can go ahead, Kate. All right, thanks so much, Nicole. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, I am with Wilmette Public Works and I do realize that not everyone on this webinar is from Wilmette. So I am going to make this kind of short and sweet. Um, I'm happy to report that later this spring, Wilmette will be installing these new refuse and recycling receptacles at 14 locations in our downtown um, in conjunction with our downtown streetscape improvement project. Um, these are all locations that were previously um, only re refuse receptacles. So now we will have recycling available throughout our downtown area. Um, the recycling receptacles will be for bottles and cans only. Uh, the signage you see on, on the screen is what will be on the cans. Um, and you know that is in at an attempt to limit contamination. Um, as Mary's presentation really highlighted, we're going for quality over quantity in these containers. Mary, next slide. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and I do want to just briefly touch on our curbside recycling program. Uh, Wilmette does have three toter sizes available for um, residential curbside recycling uh, for both refuse and recycling. Uh, when we first implemented the toter system more than a decade ago, the standard issue for each home was a 96 gallon toter for refuse and a 64 gallon toter for recycling. Um, but of course, over the last 10 years, homes are sold, families grow, needs change. And unless you've made a change over the last decade, your recycling container is more likely than not slightly smaller than your refuse container. Um, so if that is the case, I want to make sure that all Wilmette residents know that toter sizes can be swapped free of charge. Um, so if you're in need of a larger recycling container, please just reach out to Public Works. Um, and as a reminder, as Mary mentioned, all recycling does have to be inside the toter to reduce contamination. So um, if you are consistently recycling uh, more than you can fit in your container, please give us a call because um, especially any boxes or other recycling outside of the container will likely be taken as trash and landfilled. Next slide, Mary. All right, so I wanna touch on our curbside, risk, our curbside composting program, which began in 2019. It's essentially an expansion of our existing yard waste program. 
which runs uh, annually from April through November. Uh, by composting food scraps, residents are helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from landfills caused by rotting food. Food scraps are instead turned into nutrient-rich soil and soil amendments that can improve soil health and function. If you're a Wilmette resident and you're interested in participating, there's no need to sign up. We do require yard waste stickers for collection, but the toter is free to rent. And the toter is required if you want to compost food scraps along with your yard waste uh, to make sure we're keeping all those critters away from the food. Um, some acceptable food scraps include fruits, veggies, breads, pasta, cereal, non-liquid dairy, eggs, coffee grounds and filters, tea bags, and then the unacceptable items, any meat, poultry, seafood, bones, shells, uh, fats, oils, and grease, um, no service wear, fork, spoons, even if it's marked as compostable, and no liquids. And the big one is no plastic bags whatsoever, even if they are marked as compostable. Um, this is problematic as they are actually sold as, um, you know, a countertop compostable bag that you can use in your home, um, but they are not permitted in our curbside composting program. Um, they just don't break down at the same rate as the organic material. And what we end up with is a bunch of plastic bags mixed in with perfectly usable compost. All right, next slide. And finally, this is where it all ends up. Um, all of Wilmette's composted material is taken to an IEPA certified composting facility where it's aerated and screened over a period of about 60 to 90 days, depending on weather. The compost will get up to about 120 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And once it's ready, it's resold as compost, topsoil, leaf mulch, and planting mixes. All right, and our last slide is a bit of a, kind of a lightning round here. Um, electronics, and also uh, the compact fluorescent bulbs and fluorescent tube lights. Um, those are not allowed curbs, but none of this is allowed curbside, but uh, we can, you can take it all to the public works facility um, for electronic CFL bulbs and tubes. Um, the medications are accepted at our police station. The sharps are accepted at our fire station. And uh, latex paint is actually the only thing that we do take curbside on this, on this photo. As long as it's dry, it can go in the trash. And uh, they just ask that you take the lid off of the can prior to putting it in your trash. So would you like me to speak to the rest of it? Okay. Sure thing. Yep, go ahead. So uh, since 2012, um, a certain list of electronics have been banned from the landfill. So it's unlawful to throw televisions, computers, printers, fax machines, CDs, DVD players, cell phones, and a few other things into the garbage. They have to be recycled. And so Swank has different, uh, we have a year round program. We have uh, spring, summer and fall one day events. And I know that I saw some um, attendees from Northbrook and Northfield. And if you're from a different area other than Swank, your communities provide electronics programs as well. Um, some of the haulers will have an at your door service um, that you can call for a pickup um, to schedule it. Um, Apt Electronics takes a lot of the things that are come into Swank's program um, if you are a Swank resident and you have a big tube TV, you'll be charged if you go anywhere else for disposal. So that could be something you could bring to our transfer station and displays or one of the, the one day collections. But flat top screens, laptops, um, tablets, even cell phones, those can be dropped off at Best Buy, at Goodwill, Salvation Army, and even Savers. They work with electronics recyclers. So if you go to our website, you'll see a lot of different options for your electronics. And then the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency has four permit sites for oil-based paints and household chemicals. Um, they also take fluorescent bulbs with mercury. They'll take rechargeable batteries and lithium batteries. Um, as well as 
call to recycle, call to numeral two recycles backslash locator will get you a place to take the lithium primary that look amazingly similar to alkaline, but they're not, they're supercharged. And at their end of life, you need to tape the terminal end before you take it to one of the stores. Home, Home Depot and Lowe's are two of the big ones that are, are very convenient to go to. So they'll take the lithium primary, they'll take the rechargeable. Alkalines can be thrown away in the garbage if your community is not collecting them for recycling. They're benign to the environment. And then Swank does have, uh, many of our other communities have, are working with their police departments um, through Cook County's program, Sheriff's program for medications, any kind of pill. And um, the agency sponsors uh, a SHARPS program. So if you're looking for, always check with your village or your city to find out what's going on. And if you can't find an alternative, um, you can put SHARPS in a rigid um, bottle, like a laundry detergent bottle, tape the top with duct tape when it's full and mark on it SHARPS and put it in your garbage. Um, but there are a lot of other instructions on our website. I also have three updated videos. If you'd like to learn more about electronics, paint and household chemical waste and meds and sharps, they're under five minutes. There are informational videos you can find at the agency's website. So before, one more thing before um, I close and um, Nicole takes over, I just want to, um, my closing statement, it's the time for all sectors to come together to protect our earth and its resources by embracing practices and technologies that will foster a sustainable world today, tomorrow, and for generations to come. So I wanna thank you both on Kate's behalf and mine for your interest in coming tonight and learning about ways to prevent waste and to recycle right. Please share your knowledge with your family, friends, and neighbors. Thank you. And Nicole, I will turn it over, back over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Kate. Um, I feel like we're all experts at this point, right? With all the, uh, everything you guys covered, that was a lot of material. Uh, so thank you for that. And just before we go into the q and I just want to mention to everybody that um, through Zoom tomorrow, you'll receive an email. And in that email will be the link to our YouTube channel for Go, Go Green Wall Met. Um, and that's where you can watch the presentation back or share it with anybody else. And then also there will be a link to the, the one page recycling guide that Mary showed. And that's also on the Wilmet um, Village's website as well. Uh, so now we're gonna go into the Q&A session. I, think, I see we have quite a few uh, questions. I think some of them were answered um, within the presentation, but no harm in asking them again because it was a lot of information and you know having things repeated never hurts. So I'm gonna throw this over to um, Maria and her board, who's gonna go through uh, the questions and ask them of both uh, Mary and Kate. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Maria. I am the Communications and Community Outreach Associate for Go Green Wilmette, and I'm going to be moderating the very, very many wonderful questions that we have. And so we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I see 38. I know there are a couple more in the chat. Uh, and so let's uh, get started. Um, okay, Mary, confession, that was a lot of amazing information. I'm going to ask you questions that you probably already mentioned. Um, and forgive me, can't remember everything that you said. Um, so it, it was a roller coaster. <laughs> it was it a was roller fast. coaster. I realized that. So th th thank you for the opportunity to have this for, for yes. questions. A wonderful roller coaster. Okay. Um, let's see. What so I know that there's a, here's a question about light bulbs. What should happen with the light bulb recycling specifically of the incandescent bulbs? Incandescent bulbs are benign to the environment. They can go in your garbage. Oh, that's wonderful. There's nothing yeah. harmful in an incandescent bulb. What about other bulbs? So the CFL bulbs, the compact fluorescent lights and tube sticks um, contain mercury. And those are, um, a lot of our swing communities have drop-offs for those. COVID has made things very, very challenging for everybody who's wanting to get rid of things, but programs are starting to open up. Those that had been temporarily suspended, I'm starting to see 
um, open up. So check with your own municipality for their program. A lot of times they have that information on their website. Um, if it's not, you can give them a call. So the fluorescent bulbs can either go to a swank program drop off or you can take it to a household hazardous waste site. Okay, wonderful. Let's see, we have a question here about the current pricing and demand dynamics for the materials from recycling. And I think internationally is where this question is going. Sort of what's the, the status on costs and everything like that? The market prices? It says, can you talk about the current pricing and demand dynamics for the recycling material materials? So I'm assuming what recycling materials are, are perhaps more in demand in the US, maybe in the world, um, and which are not? Because I know that that fluctuates sometimes. I do know um, market prices are coming up. You can Google that. There's a, a weekly update for pricing that I don't even pay attention to much other than the trends. Um, aluminum cans are, are still pretty low for aluminum, something that used to be so solid as the, um, but gradually things are coming up, papers coming up, cardboards coming up. Um, low grade plastics are still low grade plastics. There's actually um, new technology coming up to try and manage those in a way that they would be recycled and made into fuel through a pyra pyrolysis process. Um, and then, so plastic bottles, we're seeing Coca-Cola, Pepsi. If you watched any of them, um, if you watch TV, there's new commercials out. They've committed to a hundred percent recycled content bottle and they need, the demand for that is rising as a result, which is good because then that pushes market prices up. Um, and, and the number twos, number fives for plastics, um, and then steel will always be um, a desired material. It's been recycled for a long time because it, it, these properties don't change and it can be recycled over and over again like aluminum cans. So um, just a broad general, markets are coming up for those commodities and for the ones of mixed paper grade and low plastics. Um, we still have a ways to go to solve the problem. Hi, Kiki. <laughs> You're going to see my cat. My apologies. It's, his, it's almost his dinner time. Um, a great question from Tina is, is using a brown recyclable bag to hold items and doors as sort of a makeshift recycling bin, can that brown bag itself go into the recycling container with holding other materials in it? it? So recyclers want materials loose. If you have them in a brown bag, all you have to do is tip the brown bag and leave the brown bag. They, they want it loose. They, do, they don't want things held together in bags okay. and especially plastic. Right, right. Um, we have a question here that somebody has a big pile of cut ends and unusable cloth pieces, which sounds like my mother. Um, and where is there a place that takes those loose ends of textiles that you can recommend? There are some nice donations. One, one is waste shed. Um, in Chicago, they like textiles, but if it's really minuscule, just scraps, throw them away. You know, if you don't have big enough pieces to make a quilt square, then to me, it's really insignificant. It's just waste. But if you have some decent size remnants of textiles, um, look up Waste Shed in the city. They take textiles, they take knitting, they take art kinds of things. And then they, they resell to teachers and artists and um, entrepreneurs of sorts that are creative to, to repurpose and recreate things. Also a note from Nicole that North Face also will take odds and ends, again, probably depending on the size of textile. So that's another option. In you the know, district. the best thing to do if you have a lead for something like this is call first. It's just to call first, see if anything's changed, let them know what you have. Because if I'm not seeing what you're talking about, so it's a little bit hard. So that's my advice, call first and see if the places want them. Good advice. All right, a question here about materials need to be dry. So can somebody rinse something out and then throw it in the, in the recycling? Um, the or dry does it means, bone dry? The dry is more about closing the lid. 
so the water and the snow doesn't get inside. Okay. It, it keeps the, the paper particularly drier. Okay. So if something's a little bit wet, just maybe on the outside and you put it in your recycling. Take it and put bin, it in. It's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, can pill bottles be recycled even if the labels can't come off? They can't be recycled curbside. So if you're going to go to a Jewel or an Osco, you can take an indelible marker and mark off your personal information if they won't come off, if you find a place to drop them off or if you mail them to Matthew Ministries. Okay. Um, kind of related. If packing boxes have plastic packing tape on them, can that be recycled with the tape on it? Try, try and strip it off because you're going to slice it to flatten it. So try and rip off that excess tape. And if there's plastic windows, you know, if it's left on, will it get recycled? The answer is yes, because it goes through a process and the plastic floats and the paper sinks and, and they're able to scoop off, they call contamination. But if you can rip it off easy, that's the preference. Okay, that makes sense. Um, somebody said that they may have missed this, but what about Amazon's plastic bubble envelopes? Recyclable? How to? How uh, to you know, Nicole, you might jump in on this one with tracks. Uh, some sometimes the the envelopes you have to look up plasticfilmrecycling.org um, to confirm. Um, Amazon came under a lot of fire with their plastic envelopes. And so they has, have since switched a lot of times to all, all paper. It's a, a hard paper, not quite car, um, corrugated cardboard, but we dissected it here at work and it, even the stuffing is paper. So that could go in, but plastic can't go curbside unless you can find a drop off someplace else. They're reusable. Yeah, the the TREX program will, will take that, yes. And um, the TREX website has a really good uh, kind of all-inclusive list of the film plastic that's acceptable. So it's worth um, checking out. And as plastic packaging has become more um, prevalent, um, that list has changed from the very beginning. So again, always look at the website, always call for the most up-to-date information. Yeah. All right, and it would be wonderful if Nicole or Maria can drop in the Trex website into the chat, just because I think some people are curious about what that is. Um, okay, uh, I know you went through styrofoam. Can you give a, there's a, quite a few questions about it, a very high level basic do's and don'ts with styrofoam? So styrofoam is a material that can't be put in the curbside. It's been no, polystyrene, uh, styrofoam is its trade name made, manufactured by DART. It comes in the white expanded fluffy stuff that is used um, for packaging for electronics, big things to hold it into place. That type of polystyrene can be taken back to apt electronics. Um, go to their Glenview, you know, their website in Glenview to get more information. The food containers are not accepted by Apt Electronics, but they are out at DART in Aurora. Um, they all have to be clean, no food contamination, um, but they can't go curbside. So oftentimes styrene goes in the garbage. That is great, thank you. Um, let's see. Some restaurants use aluminum containers with plastic lids. What, how does that, what can be recycled with that? Can the aluminum, aluminum containers underside? Yeah, it's, it's like a very thin aluminum container. It's kind of like ruffled around the edges and then there's a plastic lid on top. All right, like for a salad maybe. So mm -hmm. the plastic lid cannot be recycled. Isolated plastic lids cannot be recycled. The only plastic lids that can be recycled are put back on bottles and jugs. Um, but if it's, if it's an aluminum, can that can be is, is clean, you can you can recycle that. You know what, if I could go back to polystyrene for a half a second, there's a bill right now down in Illinois that um, is going to be talked about again in, in three weeks or so when um, the Zoom legislation meetings um, resume. 
And there's even something more larger than this is a national. Um, oh, I had all my stuff here to refer to here. Um, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is actually something on a national level, but there's an action that Beth's group sent out to um, send a notification to Senators um, Durbin and Duckworth to say that you're on board with this. But this is pretty, I was just looking at this and it's pretty comprehensive. It's about EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility for Packaging, minimize, um, requiring minimum recycle content for certain products, a national deposit for containers. Um, this is really huge. And I think that it carries a lot of power because it's on the national basis rather than the Illinois ban. Um, we need to be doing this on a national basis if we're going to shift um, moving forward without um, a lot of single plastics. So um, I just wanted to say that um, to pay attention to that bill. It's House Bill um, Oh, in Illinois, it's House Bill 3067. Great, thank you for that. House Bill. Can I just interject for a second? Uh, with the takeout containers, the aluminum, um, just a lot of times you can ask the establishment to use that container instead of, sometimes they use like a hybrid method, they'll use some of those and some styrofoam or some of the black plastic. Um, you can ask them just to put all of your takeout items in an aluminum container so that you then have the option to at least recycle that. And then also you can have them combine orders. Like if you do sushi, just have them put everything in one instead of two and then eliminate certain garnishes you might not eat. And obviously like Mary had mentioned, uh, not to include utensils, um, soy sauce packets, ketchup pack, things like that, that you might already have at home. And if you just put it in your order, if you're doing online, or if you call in just to kind of remind them of that. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, along the lines of aluminum foil, if you have aluminum foil that has been, you know, wrapped around a thing of cookies and you take that into a ball and you make a nice big aluminum ball, can that be recycled? Mm -hmm. Okay. As long as it, it doesn't have any food residue on it. Right. Absolutely. And making it into a ball gives it a little, it, it's not so fly away. Right. Right. Okay. Very cool. What about wrapping paper? That's a real great area. Ask your particular recycler. There are recyclers that don't want any wrapping paper. So things like wrapping paper, toilet paper, tissues, sometimes are at the end of their quality for paper recycling. Um, other times, there's so much contamination on some of our wrapping paper that it's just not worth saying we'll take it. So I'll refer, I'll, I'll recommend that you refer to your own um, recycler to see if they want it or not. And I will say for Wilmette this past year during the holidays, we did post some information about that. Um, and our understanding was that as long as it doesn't have anything shiny in it, like glitter or anything reflective, um, as long as it's kind of that matte material, um, it, is it is acceptable curbside. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Okay, what counts as plastic film? For example, can one recycle plastic packaging from washed salad greens at the grocery store? No, they don't want food film. It's, it's film from wrapping um, water bottles together. It's film from um, cleaning bags. It's my understanding that they don't want food film. Okay. Okay. Nicole, if you, you're making a face. <laughs> um, I think there's an example on the website that has a, a bread bag um, and a couple. It's my understanding it's just like anything that is kind of stretchy with your thumb is kind of an indicating factor or if it has like a number two or a number four in the triangle, that's usually an indicating factor. Um, but that stretching it with your thumb is, is whenever I reach out to Trex and ask them and have a question, she always writes back. That's kind of like the gold standard with the one exception being the cereal bag uh, and the cereal bag only because they've tested it. It's a certain type of plastic, a poly something that they've tested and have determined that they, um, can take that, uh, but that doesn't apply to things like um, 
you know, your, your cracker box, um, plastic bag, or um, other things that come in a box with the bag inside. It's, it, it's only in particular to the cereal bag. And something that um, I, I heard at a conference once is if, if you crinkle it and it makes a noise, it's not accepted. It's if you crinkle it and there's no noise that that's the soft, stretchy plastic film that Nicole's talking about. And I put the link in the chat for, for everybody to the TREX program. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty great. It tells you kind of what you can recycle, the participating stores, um, and then you can also reach out to them. There's a, a woman kind of behind the scenes uh, when you send an email that will get back to you pretty quickly if you have a, a question in particular. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question about, is there a poster with all these photos? It's a lot to remember without a visual. And so Maria just stuck the Swank website into the chat for everyone to look at. That is, I think what you said, Mary, is a little bit more interactive now. It's a little bit easier to use. And also everybody will be receiving those guidelines um, post-presentation. Exactly. Yes. Perfect. Um, okay. Someone asked where to recycle sneakers and rubber sold shoes other than Nike, if there are any other options uh, that you know of where those can be taken. A lot of um, the simple recycling will take shoes. Um, use again, drop boxes will take shoes. Um, call Goodwill, see if they will. Um, even if they're not saleable, there's still a pecking order and a sorting system for less desirable items that don't sell. Okay, thank you, that is helpful. Paper milk cartons okay to recycle? Oh, sure. Okie dokie. Some of these are gonna be more yes or no. Um, someone commented that some pet stores may take shredded paper to line their dog cages. I do know that Wilmette Pet does that and are often in great need of that because they have lots of puppies that people love to adopt. So that's a good option for that. Thanks for um, that comment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know we've, that's where we take our newspaper shreds. Um, black takeout containers with clear lid. All garbage. All garbage. Okay. Clear plastic form salads from Costco or Whole Foods. Garbage. Garbage. For glass jars, can both glass and metal lids be included? If the metal lid is three inches in diameter or larger. Okay. So even though that would be considered a mixed thing because it would be metal and glass those yeah can you can the recycler said it doesn't matter if you put it on or leave it into because those glass jars will be broken by the time the metal goes through the um the magnet okay okay perfect thank you someone said to confirm all clear plastic containers are okay regardless of triangle number i'm sorry yes Say that again. I was looking oh. at something that just popped up on the screen. No, that's okay. Are all clear plastic containers okay to recycle regardless of triangle number? No. Okay. What no. can, which high level? So again, have? let's go back to plastic bottles, jugs, milk, um, like milk jugs, um, laundry detergent bottles, food related jars, and tubs. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, do you believe we have another numbers related question further down, but we'll get to that. Um, can you put paper envelopes that have plastic in the address area into the recycling? Mm -hmm. And you do not have to take the plastic window off. Okay. Uh, somebody asked what to do with the many plastic bags from the grocery store. Someone recommended just put them in the bin in front of that grocery store, for example, you can do that right outside of Jewel. Are there any other recommendations you have for recycling? That is the only thing I know other than to reuse the plastic bag if you're gonna line a trash can or if you have um, babies around for poopy diapers, you know, to, to use it that way or walking a dog, um, you know, to pick up their poop. But um, pretty much only the retail stores are taking those plastic bags and film. Um, yeah. And at least it's being recycled. Yes. But make sure you pay, take out your paper receipts, plastic only in the film. Plastic only, okay. That's a good recommendation. 
this is an interesting one that sometimes you get uh, you know takeout boxes and they say that it can only be recycled in select locations what what are the steps that you should take so that's probably the how to recycle that's trying to help consumers recycle but it, it doesn't really uh, you know you have to ask your hauler is this can i recycle this so i think it goes you know the single serve very rarely are and the compostable even though in theory they degrade and can be composted are not accepted in our food organics programs because Kate had explained they break down differently. And if you're going to be an organic certified um, compost, you can't have any contaminants in your compost. And that includes some of the things that are in containers that are compostable. So um, rule of thumb, it would probably throw it out. Okay. Oh boy, okay, um, let's see. Can we recycle the plastic coupon cards that some businesses send out? No. What about the shiny paper ones that you can rip? They are paper, but they're shiny. As long as it's paper. Okay. Even Shiny's okay for one. paper. Okay, okay. The let's glossy, see. you like the a magazine. Glossy. That's what, I, yep, that's what I was trying to, uh, the word I was trying to come across. Um, somebody said, are Starbucks cups recyclable now? Starbucks tried to do a pilot, so everybody thinks now Starbucks, you can put it curbside. They worked with specifically with uh, a sorter, and, you know, a recycler to do their pilot. And just to try, I mean, that's how we try things, you know, the, the, the research and development. But no, single serve cups cannot go in your recycling bin. Okay. Coffee, solo cups. Um, styrofoam, no single serve cups. Okay. No straws, no lids. I'm just going to put a little plug in for the new coffee shop that's coming to downtown Wilmette. Uh, I think it's called Central Avenue Coffee Shop or something. They will allow people to bring their reusable cups. So and thank you. We're going to start seeing that again. And Starbucks also. Um, I have a Starbucks stainless steel cup that I would take in. Um, you know, it's just, I've, I'm so used to grinding my own coffee at home now and, and taking it on the go in my own cup that I, I, I don't stop and pick it up unless I'm at a conference or, you know, downtown at a meeting. Um, but it's nice if you have your own reusable water bottle, it can be refilled if you have your own reusable cup. We're going to get through this COVID thing and return back to some normalcy. And that will be part of it. I'm really happy to hear that. Because there have been some, there's been so much research done over reusables and their safety versus disposable. Reusable, hands down, is a more controlled, safer choice. Yep, I've read those studies as well. Um, are small berry containers a no-go for recycling? You have to ask your hauler. So you have waste management in Wilmette. Waste yep. management doesn't want them. They're the, the, the thermal form um, for berries, but I have Groot and Groot says they're fine. Lakeshore says they're fine. Waste management was one of the few that didn't want them. Okay. In our discussions. Um, we have a question that says uh, that they have some ones, ooh, a person has many number one PETE containers that have a sticker on them from the grocery store and presumably that sticker cannot be removed. Is that acceptable to be recycled? It is because it's, it's contamination, but it's minuscule and in the reprocessing with the heat and the chipping up and the melting down that they're able to separate that paper Okay. At, at, during the reprocessing. Okay. This question says that the brand Nusa and OOSA yogurt containers have black plastic lids that are over three inches. Can they be placed back on the clean, dry, empty yogurt container and then recycled? No. No lids on tubs or uh, jugs or, uh, uh, let me say this right so it's right. No lids on jars and tubs. No lids on jars and tubs. Only bottles and jugs. Okay, um, you answered this prior, but specifically uh, milk cartons and orange juice cartons that seem to have a waxy coating, can those be recycled? 
So it's not really wax, it's plastic. They have a layer, they have a layer of plastic, and then they have a layer of aluminum sometimes in the aseptic, like the, the, the um, juice boxes. The Carton Council has put a, invested a lot of money for MRFs to separate these materials, and they have figured out in reprocessing um, how to separate out those three different materials. Um, there's a wonderful video that I can send you the link, Nicole, if you want to share it. Um, it's on the Carton Council's um, website on that whole process. It, it's really interesting. Thank you. Can used, okay, can clean used paper towels be recycled? And I'm thinking used means just for water. No. No, no paper towels. Are you able to put paper in your composting? I, I forget. Paper towels and napkins? Uh, we discourage it only because they more often than not have food contamination on them. Um, so they have to be completely clean if they, if, if you're putting it in the compost bin. Okay. The fats, oils, and grease. If, if there's any fats, oils, and grease on it, um, that's where they cannot be composted. Okay. That makes sense. Daily newspaper sleeves, are those film? Yes. Okay. Those can go back to the retail stores with the plastic bags. Okay, perfect. Um, what about small individual size yogurt containers? Clean them out, take the lid off, and recycle them. Perfect. Unless it's a number six. Unless it's a number a six. A lot of yogurts are number six. Okay. I mean, not a lot, but there are some that are six. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any kind of egg carton that can be recycled? Is, can paper, plastic, or polystyrene be recycled? No polystyrene, no plastic, but yes to car corrugated cardboard paper. Okay. And as, as long as it's not contaminated. Sometimes sure. I get the eggs and they've broken. You know, the, the carton has to be completely clean. Right. Okay. Um, Anne asks how we can uh, respond or what, what uh, advocacy we can do to get a governmental level change. Well, right now, for, in general, it's always good to start local, but it's, there's a lot of initiatives right now happening um, on, for a lot of different things, you know, for the climate, for, for, for just so many causes. What's important to you? What's one thing that you want to do better and use your time and use your efforts to maybe get a small group together to, um, to write your legislators, to write your senators, um, to get on the bandwagon of something else that's going on there, you know, the, with the plastic, plastic pollution coalition, story is stuff. Dot org, both of them are wonderful organizations that um, inspire you to get involved um, and, and be an advocate for different things. So I just ask you what's important to you and whatever that is to find an organization. Um, if any of you want to email me afterwards, I know our slides were pretty fast, but my email is Mary. M-A-R-Y at swank, S-W-A-N-C-C dot org. And I can give you that information. Excellent, yeah, we can put that in the chat as well. Um, okay, we have just four more minutes and I think that this is uh, a question that maybe many people have about simplifying recyclability. Recyclability? Recyclability. Uh, is there any chance to simplify categorization of recyclability or just the process in general for the general public? What's being done to kind of make it a little bit easier for the average person who is willing to recycle to know all of the rules, especially because they do change? They change all the time. I've been um, with Swank for 25 years. I was 12 when I started. Um, and <laughs> it's been nothing but change. And you just have to pay attention um, and ask questions of your, 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 your village or your city recycler um, who works closely with the hauler, the, the recycler, to make sure that you have up-to-date things. Um, what I'm telling you tonight, you can invite me back in a year, and I guarantee I'm going to tell you something different with 
some of the materials that will have avenues for recycling that aren't available today. Um, and just pay attention and know that it's quantity, quality over quantity. Do not wish cycle something. It's better when in doubt, throw it out to be a good recycler by not recycling everything curbside, but be a good recycler to find other resources outside the curbside restrictions for materials that you have. And Swank provides a lot on our website. Wonderful. Okay, one, one last question that maybe you can answer in one sentence. It's near and dear to my heart. I study the ocean uh, at the University of Michigan. What is ocean bound plastic and why is it important? We have two questions about that. What is it? Ocean bound plastic, yes. Ocean going on cargo ships or just litter? I two questions about ocean bound plastic, perhaps litter, perhaps cargo ships, whatever, however you want to there, answer. That. There's a lot of reasons that um, plastics are in our waterways. Um, I'd explain the sorting in third world countries is different than here. And some of the discards just went into the environment. And if something is on the beach or it's on the ground. Um, with wind and with storm, it will find its ways into the sewer. It'll find its way out to lakes, into ponds and tributaries. So there's so many ways for it to travel from land into the waters. And then there's the, the issues with the cargo ships being at sea in a storm and having cargo ships of pellets and other things go overboard. Um, so there's a lot of ways that pollution is happening. Um, there are a lot of wonderful cleanups for ocean, five gyres. Um, I mentioned pa Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, so there are some great efforts and you can link onto their websites to see what they're doing and even how you might be involved. Great, thank you so much, Mary. And thank you, Kate, as well. And Nicole, I will turn it back over to you. That's great. There are a lot of, lot of great questions. I hope, hopefully we cleared up some confusion for everybody. Maria, thank you for facilitating the Q&A. That was really helpful. Um, so again, I just want to thank Mary and Kate. Um, you guys always hit it out of the ballpark and give us all the information we need, and that's really appreciated. Um, I will just mention one last time that we do have uh, several webinars coming up and planned, and you can go to goinggreenmatters.org to register for those. Um, We'll have one on trees, uh, actually a three-part series on trees. We'll have uh, one on native plants right before our native, native plant sale on May 8th. And then we'll have one that's going to be planned. It's not quite, doesn't have a date set yet, but it's simple swaps for low waste living. Um, so be sure to check our website, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on, on Instagram and uh, Facebook as well. So with that, we're gonna conclude tonight and we thank you all for joining. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.